American legal scholars have lifted the bonnet on American plea bargaining for, for the last 30 years, and we know quite a lot about it. Um, <clears throat> and we know the excesses that it can lead to and the coercive nature. Um, and and I, I think my position, I think would be true of other sort of comparative scholars would be that uh, when, we're not so keen on the American system. Yeah, I'm not too keen on it either, to be honest. Over a million Americans face sentencing every year, and it will be the most important day of their lives. But we don't fully understand the system, how broken it is, and what we can do to make it better. I'm Doug Passan. I'm a 25-year criminal defense lawyer and a sentencing expert. My goal is to bring more awareness, more fairness, and more humanity to the sentencing process. So, are you ready? Then let's get set for sentencing. Hey everybody, this is Doug Passan coming to you from Studio 3553 in Scottsdale, Arizona, helping us get set for sentencing today. A very special guest. Now, I know I say that a lot, all my guests are special, but this is pretty cool because this is the first time I've had somebody on uh, from another country, and it's the first of what I hope will be many episodes where um, we take a look at how other countries do criminal justice, specifically sentencing, and what we can learn from that and, and get their perspective on how we do things in our country. So, today, getting set for sentencing, we have... Professor Julian Roberts. He is the executive director of the Sentencing Academy in the UK. He's a professor of criminology in the Center for Criminology in the University of Oxford uh, and former member of the Sentencing Council of England and Wales from 20, 2009 to 2018. He also has a lot of, a lot of um, experience in the American system because he's been over here doing work. He was an advisor to the American Law Institute for the Model Penal Code and sent, uh, Model Penal Code Sentencing Project. He's been a visiting professor of law in some American institutions. So I could go on and on and on about your bio, but I just wanted to say hello, welcome, thank you for being here, and let's dig in. Thanks a lot, Doug. Uh, pleasure to be on your podcast. Heard, heard great things about it. Thank you. So real quick, tell me what the um, Sentencing Academy in the UK is. What, what's the function there? It's a um, privately funded sort of think tank, which does research, engages with practitioners, the judiciary, um, <clears throat> uh, tries to improve sentencing, increase public confidence, uh, public awareness and knowledge of sentencing not hugely dissimilar to the sentencing project in Washington, although uh, it's a much smaller operation <clears throat> because we've only been going a few years. Okay, so I'm coming at this pretty cold. Um, I know virtually next to, oh, well, really nothing about the way sentencing works, criminal justice system works generally in the UK. So um, let's just basically start from my perspective, which is, the government thinks you did something wrong. They bring a charge either through a grand jury or uh, through preliminary hearing. If there's probable cause, the prosecution commences. Um, trials are basically non-existent in the United States, which will, for reasons we'll probably go deeper into. Um, but then it's sentencing, and the judge is almost always the one person who decides the fate of the criminally accused, unless, of course, it's a capital case and then it's a jury. Um, what's it like in your neck of the woods? Well, it, it's not hugely dissimilar, but I'll just touch on a couple of differences. So um, <clears throat> citizen reports of victimization, the police investigate, they, they pass the file to the Crown Prosecution Service. They, they then apply uh, the prosecutorial test. Um, <clears throat> one is the sufficiency of evidence uh, test. And the second is whether a prosecution is in the public interest. And if the case passes that threshold, they will lay a charge. Uh, the accused <clears throat> will then appear in the magistrate's court, which is a lower level of court, where <clears throat> uh, the case will be heard initially by a panel of lay magistrates, three lay persons without legal qualification, uh, sitting in a, in a panel. 
Um, they have a legal advisor um, and they'll hear the case and determine sentence unless they feel that it's too serious or would result in a sentence which is outside their powers, at which, at which point they decline jurisdiction and the case is transferred to the superior court known as the Crown Court. And in the Crown Court, <clears throat> the trial will be held um, uh, in front of a jury and there will be a judge obviously presiding. At the end of the trial, the tribunal of fact, that's the jury, will reach a verdict and if they convict the defendant, then the uh, judge will proceed to impose sentence and he or she will then apply sentencing guidelines in England and Wales, which we will probably talk about later. Okay, one thing I didn't hear in that whole litany is plea bargain. Does that not mm. exist? Is plea bargaining not well, a thing? <clears throat> plea bargaining, <clears throat> um, I mean, the official story is it doesn't really occur in England and Wales. Um, I, I think it would be more accurate to say that it's far more modest or muted. So there will be discussions uh, periodically between counsel, between uh, <clears throat> the Crown Prosecution a lawyer and the defense advocate, uh, but it won't be anything like as robust or as engaged or as determinative as it is in the in the um, in, in the United States, uh, and that's in part because the prosecution branch, uh, I think, is probably uh, less influential in the, in the outcome. So that classic American uh, adversarial sentencing hearing, where you've got. <clears throat> <clears throat> the Crown Attorney who's putting a robust case uh, <clears throat> for the state uh, and there's uh, pushback from the defence lawyer uh, who's recommending a totally different disposition. One may be recommending uh, lengthy imprisonment and the other something far less severe. In England and Wales, the prosecution play, uh, as they say, a more muted role at sentencing. So they, they won't actually <clears throat> often make a formal sentencing submission. They'll point out the sources of aggra aggravation, aggravating factors, and they might suggest to the judge that this looks like a category one, because uh, the guidelines have categories. This looks like a category one case, um, and they won't say too much more, and they, they won't engage in, in adversarial <clears throat> back and forth with the defense counsel. Uh, in, in other common law jurisdictions, Canada, we are more familiar, um, you know, the, defense counsel may make assertions about his client um, and the Crown may push back on that. Well, really? Uh, you know, so what's the evidence for this? Uh, here, uh, the sentencing hearing will be uh, <clears throat> more constrained. The prosecutor will make the opening remarks and talk about aggravation uh, and possibly relate the case to some category of the guidelines. And then there'll be the speech and mitigation by the defense advocate uh, and, and the defendant will be given a, 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 the opportunity to hear. But to go back to your original question, uh, plea bargaining <clears throat> uh, per se uh, is far less <clears throat> frequent here. Um, uh, and it is in part because the prosecutor is not quite uh, as adversarial as that. I think it, it is the case in the US. I imagine that you have a pretty good perspective on how prevalent plea bargaining is in our system. And and oftentimes how coercive plea bargaining can be and how much power and um, uh, and how draconian the laws are and all that stuff. So it sounds like very different there. Um, what's your take on whether it's better or worse to have your system versus ours? Well, I think, I mean, American legal scholars have lifted the bonnet on American plea bargaining for, for the last 30 years, and we know quite a lot about it. Um, <clears throat> and we know the excesses that it can lead to and the coercive nature. Um, and and I, I think my position, I think would be true of other sort of comparative scholars would be that uh, when, we're not so keen on the American system. Um, <clears throat> of course, part of that comes from the uh, lengthy mandatory sentences that may be used to leverage the defendant or lengthy sentences in general, which may be used to leverage a plea out of the defendant. Um, <clears throat> but I, I think the general consensus, certainly in Canada and, and, and England and Wales, would be uh, we'd rather stay away from that kind of a system. From what we've learned from the scholarship, 
Yeah, I'm not too keen on it either, to be honest. And one of the things that also plays a part in this is bail, a pretrial incarceration. Uh, and we're having a lot of debates about that right now. But the fact is, you know, if you're sitting in jail and you can't make bail because you don't have the money and you're offered a plea bargain that might get you out of jail immediately or much sooner than otherwise, if you would have gone to trial, you're going to take that plea. And sometimes you're going to take that plea whether you did it or not. Yeah. Um, but do you guys have bail? Like, is that a part of this process? How does that work? Well, yeah, sure. The, the defendant, uh, the, the pretrial detention <clears throat> rates are relatively low here. <clears throat> it's not the problem it is in, uh, for example, some African jurisdictions and, and Canada, for that matter. Uh, higher uh, detention rates is it's less of an issue here. Um, you know, most defendants will get bail. <clears throat> and I suppose the only link to what you just said is that uh, there may be cases where uh, a defendant will be in in pretrial custody, and she's she's got to get home to you know to look after an elderly relative or dependents, um, or she may have various reasons for wanting to get out of prison fast. In, in which case, she enters a guilty plea, knowing that the plea will uh, may well um, change a short prison sentence into a suspended sentence. In which case, she won't go to prison at all. So. Uh, that would be the fear here, uh, that the plea reductions, uh, which are not anything like the magnitude in the U.S., but the, the possibility that the plea can change the quantum, the nature of the sanction, not just the quantum, um, may encourage some vulnerable defendants to plead guilty when they have a legal defense. But it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, so I'm hearing that a person can choose to plead guilty and not have a trial in the UK, and, but that that is basically their own choice and not something they're necessarily going to negotiate with the prosecutor? That's correct. I mean, <clears throat> the, the, uh, the person will be, have access to legal advice, uh, either through legal aid or through a private lawyer, and they, at their first court appearance, which will be in the magistrates, lower courts, uh, they'll be asked to enter a plea. And before they enter a plea, they'll get some information, possibly from the court. They can ask for a sentence indication. Uh, <clears throat> ask the court, in the event that my client pleads guilty, uh, what are we talking, Your Honor? And the court will give an indication of, of likely sentence. And at that point, uh, the lawyer can advise his or her client. And the lawyer can also tell the client that if you enter the plea at the first court appearance, which is tomorrow morning or whatever, <clears throat> um, you will get one third off and uh, because there's a guideline which regulates that. So there's, a, there's quite a bit of legal certainty around the impact of the plea upon the outcome. Okay. Um, I wanted to go back and cover something that I heard, but I, I'm curious about, and that is the magistrates, the sort of first level there. You said those are... <laughs> basically lay people with no with no legal training that preside over these? Yeah, this is an interesting feature of English justice. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so the magistrates <clears throat> have existed since about 1350. And um, <clears throat> the first tier of courts, as they say, run by, <clears throat> operate by the magistrates. They'll sit in panels of three, occasionally two. And they have a legal advisor. And the idea is that community... Uh, that, that the community is therefore more engaged, that the magistrates uh, who apply and are appointed uh, derive from the local community. So there's an, there's an element of community justice. And, you know, this is um, a way of the community being part of the justice system. Uh, and so the argument has been made that lay persons introduce this kind of popular element. Um, and so for many cases, this would be the most appropriate way to adjudicate that, that they actually have a lot of power. They can now, there's a recent reform, they can impose a prison sentence of up to 12 months. Um, <clears throat> and beyond that, then they would decline jurisdiction and send it to the Crown Court. Uh, uh, it's, it's a controversial branch of English justice. I think uh, 
most people are quite supportive of the lay magistrates, but others are more skeptical. I mean, you may say, well, look, you know, if it's so, if we, if we want our adjudicators to be well trained and legally qualified and experienced as barristers and so on and so forth, experienced practitioners, why would we hand it over to a, a group of amateurs? Because that's what they are. I don't mean that in a demeaning sense. They're not remunerated. They only sit about <clears throat> 10, 15 days a year. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can be a magistrate and not get a great deal of experience. They have this legal advisor. <clears throat> so they'll retire. And if there's a, a, a complex point of law, like we'll the advisor in and say, hey, uh, can we do this? And the advisor will, will guide them. Um, so it, it, it's a, an element of, of British justice that not, people, not many people know about. But it must be said that 95% of sentences are imposed by these magistrates. Uh, so sentencing in the Crown Court, the Superior Court, is, is, accounts for only a small percentage of all sentences. Well, so that I think is, <laughs> reveals that I think reveals something very important because if you're saying that the sentences they can uh, impose are a maximum of 12 months, in our if I was going to relate this to our system, those are basically the misdemeanors. Those are the <laughs> le le least serious charges. Um, you know, your trespasses, your very minor assaults, um, your dr DUIs, first time driving on the, those little, you know, those things, right? So, but yeah. I, those statistics to me, if 95%, that, what that tells me is that um, UK has much lower sentencing ranges for more serious crimes that would be considered more serious in the states am i am i getting yeah, that right yeah. <clears throat> tell is, me about this that this is true i mean england and wales sits between uh the european jurisdictions and the us in terms of overall severity so our prison sentences are much longer than they are in germany or france or italy um <clears throat> but they're definitely shorter than those imposed for comparable offenses in the us um, how much shorter is a little bit hard to know because the, obviously the fence descriptions uh, vary a great deal and you, you have more mandatory minimum sentences of imprisonment so there are all these complicating factors. But in terms of the prison population per, per general population, the prison population is much higher in the US than England and Wales, uh, although we are much higher than most of the Europeans. I wish I had my friend Mark Allenbaugh on the podcast right now because he's the sentencing statistics guru. But I've learned enough from Mark to uh, do my own math in the head, which means if 95% of these sentences are 12 months or less, then your average sentence in England is less than a, a well, well less than a year, probably. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, this is this is this is true. Okay. It's complicated by the existence of suspended sentence orders, which can go a bit longer, and so on. There yeah. are various complicating factors, but uh, it's, as a general proposition, it's safe to conclude that sentencing is more lenient here than it is in the U.S. So we have. Um, I just did a conversation about the federal sentencing guidelines, and before they were in existence, more than half sometimes close to 60% of people's uh, sentenced federally were getting probation, non-custodial sentences. And then the guidelines came out and everybody was going to prison. And in my experience <clears throat> in federal law, which is more than 20 years in federal court, um, it's a heck of a lot longer than 12 months most of the time. And mm -hmm. we have some lovely thing we love to call mandatory minimums, uh, which ties the judge's hands. And uh, you don't have those, right? That's not a thing. We have a small number of mandatory minimums. So, um, <clears throat> for example, possession of a firearm, restricted firearm, carries a five-year minimum sentence. Uh, but our mandatory minima, we don't have many. Uh, the ones that we do have also carry some judicial discretion. So a court can step beneath the mandatory minimum uh, if it finds exceptional circumstances justify that. And what, give me an example of what some exceptional circumstances could be. Um, <clears throat> well, it could be a firearms offense where the, uh, the weapon was a World War II firearm and the, the, uh, the owner had made all these, <clears throat> taken all these steps to be compliant with uh, 
um, <clears throat> the firearms legislation and there was just this one particular weapon and you know the defendant is quite elderly and didn't know about this Luger sitting in his attic this kind of thing <clears throat> something which would make it, it sort of unjust or uh, disproportionate to impose a five-year minimum sentence uh, that, that said um, the number of cases where the court does find exceptional circumstances is pretty small uh, so the, the legislation is broad, but the courts have narrow tailored it. To, so uh, there are some cases where you would think, well, surely that's an exception. And the court has said, no, that's 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 not a, that's not exceptional enough. So um, it's interesting because you still call those mandatory minimums. But if the judge has discretion, that's in, a, in my world, not really mandatory. I mean, that that's. I think if you talk to, you probably have talked to American judges who deal with mandatory minimums and drug cases and things like that, and that's a source of their greatest frustration. They have zero discretion. Yeah, um, or, yeah. so I mean, it's a qualified mandatory minimum, but um, as I say, it's a pretty heavy presumption in favor of the mandatory. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and to overturn that presumption, the, the, the defense would need to put a pretty powerful argument in favor of exceptional circumstances. And so that's probably a good segue then to, you know, my whole thing is sentencing advocacy and powerful argument is my bread and butter. I think that, you know, especially in our system where every case goes to sentence, sentencing and, and it's really the most important day of a client's life, then everything goes into to convincing this judge what the, the just result is and there's no limitation. There's no rules of evidence that apply in our system. And, you know, that's why I'm able to do these <clears throat> sentencing mitigation videos and present video testimonials. And there's no limit. It has to be credible. You know, I say the only limits are your, the, um, you know, your, your, your common sense, basically, you know, your good judgment about what might move the needle in court or what might not. Um, a do, do, defense lawyers have the ability to present a robust sentencing mitigation case like that there? Sure. Um, <clears throat> the speech and mitigation, as you say, is critical. Uh, <clears throat> sort of surprising given um, <clears throat> its importance. There isn't more uh, attention devoted in, in, in law school, but uh, over here <clears throat> or Canada. Same here. But the <clears throat> speech and mitigation is very important. Um, and you're right. Uh, <clears throat> the evidentiary rules change. Here, I mean, the defense can put anything on the table. It would have to be, a, you know, some kind of threshold, an air of reality or something. Uh, but generally speaking, they, they can put it all on the table and make their arguments. Um, and uh, it's, very, it's very important. And, and it can, and, and they can, and they do move the dial. Um, and, and now, of course, they the speech mitigation will be structured to accommodate the guidelines. So in the past, you would have a florid, eloquent speech and mitigation. Your Honor, let me tell you about my client. Now it might be a bit more focused. Your Honor, the, my client is clearly category three in culpability. You know, and I'm going to explain why. And then the, the, <clears throat> the advocate will get on to personal mitigation and then sort of the sky's the limit. You know, he was a Boy Scout. And, you know, he's done this and that. <clears throat> so that's all still in there. Um, <clears throat> but it's become framed in recent years by the arrival of our guidelines. So I didn't realize the guidelines are a relatively new phenomenon there. That How new <clears throat> are they? Well, they've been evolving. <clears throat> um, the first guideline came out in 2004, and we had three or four offense-specific and a couple of general guidelines over the next uh, six, seven years. And then in 2011, a new council, 2010, a new council was created. And in 2011, uh, <clears throat> that new council started issuing guidelines. And... <clears throat> As of, uh, I guess, last year, they, they, they issue a guideline for every high-frequency offense. And <clears throat> we should probably talk about the guidelines, but the big difference is that in Minnesota or the federal guidelines, you've got a grid. Minnesota, they've got three grids, obviously. But the main grid in Minnesota accommodating all those state offenses, all of them within that single grid, 
we have a different approach. We have a sentencing guideline for every offense. Um, and so <clears throat> if you can imagine a guideline which contains a little mini grid and a lot of other information for every offense, manslaughter, uh, rape, <clears throat> theft from a shop, you name it. <clears throat> so this, uh, <clears throat> so for Minnesota or the US guideline schemes, uh, the guidelines came out like a big bang and <clears throat> boom, there's the grid now covers, we've now issued guidance for all the offenses in the state. Whereas in England and Wales and other jurisdictions, um, it's been iterative. Okay, so <clears throat> if this is February, it's gotta be manslaughter. And you know, in two months time, we'll issue uh, firearms offense guideline. So it's, it's taken 10 years to cover all the offenses because the development of a guideline, any individual guideline takes about a year to develop to consult, to road test, and then finally to issue in definitive form. Um, guessing you were deep, deeply involved in the process before 2004 and before the guidelines came out. So there's a before and an after. What, what's your perspective on which is working better? Well, I'm a guidelines advocate. So <clears throat> your listeners might want to take on board that declaration. Uh, I, I was with the Canadian Sentencing Commission in the 1980s, and so I arranged some guidelines from an early point. Uh, I think the English guidelines um, are very useful, and but I thought that before they came in. Another question is, you could say, well, I'm from Missouri, you, you yeah, prove it. <clears throat> what have they done? And I, I think they have improved sentencing in England and Wales. We went from a purely discretionary system um, <clears throat> with limited appellate review uh, and appellate sentencing uh, guideline judgments, very rare, to a system where there is a guideline for every offense. We've got transparency. Guidelines are available for everyone to see. You know, <clears throat> so if you say, well, look, you know, tell me about sentencing for rape. <clears throat> what, what do people get and <clears throat> kind of sentences and blah, blah, blah. And you say, well, look, you know, go ask some university professor or speak to a lawyer. You know, you don't have to do that. Go on the Sentencing Council website, take a look at the guideline. You can see the kinds of sentences that people get for different forms of rape. You can see the factors taken into account. You can you can see it all. So transparency is increased. I think consistency is increased, too, but we don't have very systematic, reliable data on that. <clears throat> Um, but if you ask, and this may be the acid test, if you ask practitioners, judges, magistrates, um, <clears throat> and, and legal practitioners, they say, and because there has been good research done on the perceptions of practitioners, they say that sentencing is more consistent and more transparent um, and more proportionate as a result of the introduction of the guidelines. So I think it's a success story. Um, and I think guidelines are a success story wherever they've been adopted, although the degree of success is obviously going to vary. Does each guideline have mitigating and aggravating factors built into it? It does. So <clears throat> this is one of the advantages of an offense-specific guideline. Uh, there'll be general factors, premeditation, previous convictions. These apply to all kinds of cases. But then there'll be factors specific to a particular offense. Impaired driving causing death, dangerous driving causing death. So an obvious aggravating factor there is uh, defendant ignores pleas by occupants of the vehicle to slow down. So mm, all these factors which are particularly related to any given offense are in the guideline. Uh, they're for everyone to see. And the idea, of course, is that all courts are now looking at the same set of mitigating and aggravating factors and applying them, plus any put on the table by the advocates. Well, can we play this hypothetical drunk driving situation now? Because I'd like to be the defense lawyer, offer up what I would typically say in mitigation and see where that how that fits into the structure of your guidelines so um, in this case it, it wasn't a plea to slow down it was 
three people who were drinking and, and partying together all night who willingly got the two passengers who willingly got into the vehicle knowing full well the driver was deeply impaired um, and a crash happened and one of the occupants of the vehicle is killed there was a delay in the uh, ambulance and medical treatment arriving to the extent that the person who died might have survived if if there was a better response and by the way the reason my client has such a terrible drinking problem is that she was systematically abused sexually and physically all throughout her childhood and and exposed to drugs and alcohol at the age of 12 and she's never had meaningful alcohol or drug treatment otherwise she probably wouldn't have been so, as intoxicated as she was that night how do i do that yeah, well, it's a, it's a good example. It's an interesting kind of scenario, fact pattern to consider because <clears throat> the way our guidelines approach that offense or any offense for that matter is to say, okay, counsel, you put a lot of factors on the table, <clears throat> a lot of issues for us to deal with. We're going we're gonna to do this in a systematic way. We're going to start with step one. Or we're going to proceed through a series of steps. You talked about the sexual abuse uh, that your client suffered and so on. But well, park that counsel, come back to that. Step one <clears throat> in the guideline requires a court to determine the harm of the offence, how many people were injured or killed, um, how much additional damage was done, these sorts of things, and a culpability of the offender. So did he flagrantly ignore warnings? How far over the speed limit was he? How long had he been driving at, at an excess uh, rate? How inebriated was he? How over the <clears throat> drink driving limit was he? So we'll figure out all those things. We'll consider all those factors which are in the guideline and that will generate a category range, let's say two to four years and a, a starting point three years imprisonment. So that's <clears throat> step one. And, and then we'll proceed. Now we're going to consider aggravating and mitigating factors. And the Crown has noted that two of the witnesses, including two of the victims, including the deceased, were, were either recorded or on record. They pleaded for him to slow down. So an aggravating factor. He was... 42 miles per hour over the limit. So this is very aggravating and so on. The so Crown's put that on the table and acknowledged that there are mitigating factors. And so many of these will be related to the offence. So he was a new driver. Um, he, he didn't have very much experience, your client. Um, <clears throat> and things went a little bit to his head. It's not as though he's been doing this for 20 years. He's got no, uh, you know, no previous uh, convictions for this offence. So, so these are sort of offence related. And so we'll take those into account and the court will move from three up and down in that range. And <clears throat> then you've got your personal mitigation factors, the sexual abuse, the impoverished childhood, the this, the that, um, <clears throat> the encouragement by other people to get behind the wheel, uh, all this sort of stuff, or possibly there was a medical emergency and you know, he knew he was drunk, but he just got, boom, uh, got to get the, you know, this person to the hospital. So at, at that point, you will hear the, the speech and mitigation and the court will arrive at a provisional sentence, 18 months, 18 months imprisonment. And then we go through uh, the remaining steps so one additional step we now come to is your client entered a guilty plea at the first reasonable opportunity. So we'll take a third off. So we're down to 12 months in prison now. <clears throat> did he do any time in custody? Yes, he did. Okay, we take that off. And there's the sentence. So the sentencing process is broken down into a series of steps. And I liken it a little bit to a medical diagnosis. Patient comes in. Massive headache. Uh, the doctor doesn't say, "Oh, that sounds like migraine." You know, uh, what can I pres prescribe? You start with a series of questions. Okay, how long have you had it? Is it dull or sharp? You know, 
it going through arriving at a scientific diagnosis, even if the physician knows this is migraine, this is migraine, um, still going to follow the orderly sequence. So it, it's a little bit like that. It, it's a systematic approach. That's the idea. Um, but it's obviously more complicated than the Minnesota grid or the federal, federal grid, where you go in, boom, level nine, criminal history four, what have we got? Yeah. And I think it's an interesting kind of overlap that your guidelines really revved up in 04 and our guidelines federally sort of, I wouldn't say disintegrated, but really radically changed in 05 when they became discretionary under Booker because they were very rigid. And then all of a sudden now, and when you said, you know, now the, the allocution or the sentencing statements are really geared towards compartmentalizing into these various guidelines, from my perspective, it kind of made my heart sunk because that, to me, that feels constricting. Whereas once the our guidelines became discretionary, we got to kind of put them aside and say, I know that's what these guidelines say, but these guidelines have never worked that great. They're not based in pure, on empirical data and they're wrong and they're broken. So let's just look over here, which is uh, 3553, the statute that says you've got to just look at the nature of circumstance of the offense the history and characteristics of the offender and these these various guidelines. So we've kind of, in a lot of instances, shoved our guidelines t off into a corner. At least that's what we'd like to think as defense lawyers. And um, many judges are, you know, deviating, routinely deviating from the guidelines. And I know that that it runs counter to the goal of public understanding and, and um, respect for the system, we saw it manifest in our Supreme Court confirmation hearing of Judge Katanji Brown Jackson when the whole discussion was, we well, have all these child pornography guidelines and she wasn't, she was giving them lower sentences, therefore she must love pedophiles. So it was a ridiculous argument. So it's, you know, I guess it's a, it's a both way street. I think the bottom line is if the guidelines are built right, then it would be okay to play within that sandbox our guidelines are not i mean most mm. would tell would would tell you so um that's super interesting you mentioned limited appellate review um I, that's a big problem in our system too there's a lot of finality that goes along so that it's very hard to challenge once it's over sounds like there is maybe some similarity in our system there well i think the the limited appellate review refers more to the period before the guidelines, um, <clears throat> mm. the Court of Appeal Criminal Division in England or Wales um, is pretty heavily engaged in, in sentence appeals now. And, and of course, it works in conjunction with the guidelines authority of the Sentencing Council, which is the equivalent of <clears throat> the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission. So when the council devises a guideline, it looks at appellate decisions. As, a, as the basis starting point. And when, uh, the, sent when the Court of Appeal hears a sentence appeal, um, the key question will be, well, how does this l look in terms of the guideline? Did the, did the trial judge misapply the guideline? Uh, so the, the two work together. And the Court of Appeal elaborates on the guideline. So there might be a guideline factor, might be a bit ambiguous, and the Court of Appeal will say, well, this is how this is how this should be taken into account. So the two work together. Um, but it, it is a fact of, of appellate scrutiny in the entire common law world with, with the, that the standard of review is quite high for a Court of Appeal, as my understanding of the sort of the common law norm, Court of Appeal will only interfere with the trial court sentence if there was an error in law, which is quite rare, or if the sentence was manifestly unfit uh, so for the sentence to be manifestly, you know, for the, for the court to interfere, the sentence has to be manifestly unfit and, and not too many sentences are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you may not have to achieve. Yeah. Okay. We, we have an appeal waiver in a lot of our, most of our plea agreements that says you can't, if the judge imposes a sentence within the range, you, you have no right to appeal at all. Yeah, um, this, this strikes me as being unfair. I mean, I understand <clears throat> the state's reasons for that, but I, it, yeah, it strikes me as yep. being unfair.
Yep. So when a sentencing happens, um, you talked a lot about the statement made by counsel and by the client. Does anyone else get to speak? Sometimes, you know, we're bringing family members or clergy or people in to advocate on, speak on their behalf or write a sentencing letter. Does that happen? Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> possibly not quite so much, but there'll be a pre-sentence report. Um, always if custody's on the table. Uh, it, it may be prepared on the day. It may not be that fulsome, but, but you know, there'll be a pre-sentence report, particularly if it's requested um, by, the, by the court. So that's one thing. Um, Who does that? Uh, that will be done by the probation service. Oh, okay, like ours. They'll, in, they'll interview the, the defendant. Uh, there might be other professional reports. Mental health may be an issue. Uh, get some mental health opinion. Um, <clears throat> People will write letters on behalf of the defendant. Uh, uh, maybe character witnesses called uh, defendant's employer. Um, let's not forget the victim in all this. The, the victim can depose a victim impact statement. We call it victim personal statement, which is interesting <clears throat> because when the victim impact statement regime came in in England and Wales, didn't really want it to be associated with the US scheme. So we call it a victim personal statement. Hmm. But it effectively is the same with the, with the one distinction that the victim, as in other common law jurisdictions like Canada or Australia, victim cannot recommend a sentence. So she, she describes the effect of the crime on her life, her family, and so on and so forth. And the victim, I think it's, it's rare, but the victim may appear at the sentencing hearing um, uh, but usually the victim statement will be read by the prosecutor or extracts will be read by the prosecutor. It will be brought to the attention of the court. So there'll be that. But we won't have, I mean, it's, you know, I suspect it's a minority of cases in the US, but you, you hear about these capital cases, videos of, of the deceased and all this sort of stuff. Uh, we wouldn't have that. Um, and although the evidentiary rules are relaxed quite a bit at sentencing, um, the court will say, no, I don't think we, we need to hear from this person or no, um, we're not going to receive that, that evidence. So there will, there will be some lines which will be laid down. Do you, okay, so you said the prosecutor really doesn't recommend sentence. The victim is not allowed to recommend sentence. Is it common for the defense to really specifically set forth what they want the sentence to be then? Definitely. And uh, that's where the advocate's speech and mitigation will, will say, Your Honor, um, you know, it's, it's an open and shut case from our perspective. Uh, it would be a monstrous injustice to incarcerate my client in light of the facts that I brought before you here today. And so real quick on sentencing videos, because you mentioned it, um, we do them in capital, but we also do them a lot in non-capital cases. And um, is that a thing at all? Have you ever heard of something like that happening? I've never heard of it happening. <clears throat> and I suspect a court wouldn't allow it. Um, I mean, obviously, the victim impact statements can be very moving uh, in cases, you know, homicide cases, murder cases in particular. Um, <clears throat> but I've never heard <clears throat> of anyone introducing, you know, I don't like to watch this videotape of the deceased for the next 20 minutes sort of thing. Um, it, well, it would what, be deemed to be too <clears throat> well. Its prejudicial value would over uh, would over you know overrule its probative value. I think that would be the perspective of the court. Okay, so on the flip side, though, what about a video submitted on behalf of the defendant about their life story or people ta talking in, on their behalf? Well, <clears throat> I don't think too many of the defendants appearing in England or Wales have the resources uh, to commission such a videotape. And it would be very unusual. I certainly never heard of it. We don't have, you know, these mitigation experts uh, that you have in the US where, where you can hire somebody to advise you if your <clears throat> defense counsel advise you and maybe even prepare some materials and so on. Uh, I've never really heard that either. It's, uh, it's quite unheard of. Interesting. So, and that's kind of a common miss, well, an assumption that these are really um, high dollar uh, 
in projects. You know, in, in our country, we have public defender offices, and uh, a lot of folks in within those offices have the skills to do it, so they don't have to hire somebody outside, and and they can produce it on no budget. Um, but I guess that really raises the question of what, because you mentioned legal aid, you do have legal aid. What are those? What does legal aid look like in in the UK? Well, before I get to legal aid, just a comment. <clears throat> I wasn't being um, deprecating, uh, de no, depreciating these these advice. I think it's a very good idea um, <clears throat> to to have uh, some external source that can help the defence advocate prepare. Um, you know. Uh, an effective and powerful speech and mitigation, whether it's internal or external. So I think it's a very good idea. We're, we're just not sort of set up or resourced enough to do it. Mm -hmm. so, so even a wealthy defendant appearing for sentence in England or Wales, I, I don't think would turn to one of these, <clears throat> even if he or she could find a sentence advisor. To, I don't think they'd do that. Mm -hmm. Legal aid, <clears throat> well, it's a controversial subject. It's been cut back a great deal. Um, the legal aid rates for, for the criminal bar have been um, atrociously low for many years. And um, you may have read, we just had a barrister's strike, just got settled. The barristers have accepted the new contract. But, but one of the, the key um, claims in, the, in their uh, industrial action was that the legal aid rates were too low and, and people were leaving the criminal bar in droves. So um, <clears throat> even now, um, the rates are pretty pitiful uh, for appearing. Um, <clears throat> and uh, although the legal aid system, I think, is, is functioning pretty well, um, it, it's still a problem. Uh, and there's still a lot of people who um, will have to pay for their own lawyer. And there is, as, as is the case, I understand in Canada too, an increasing number of self-represented litigants and and that's always a concern, and it takes more time, and the court's got to intervene. So legal aid <clears throat> um, is one of the finer aspects of British or any, any justice system, of course, uh, but it's, it's, it's sagging a bit at present due to yeah. underfunding. Well, it's like the guidelines. It only works if it's a strong foundation and well-researched, well-funded, good people doing good work. Otherwise, yeah. it's just... Uh, you know, it's a facade is what it is. Yeah. And, I, and I didn't think you were being deprecating. It's, I think it's, it's a raw nerve for me because in this country, I mean, that is what I do, sentencing mitigation videos and, and, and um, any press or attention that any sentencing expert, because this is a growing thing, and I just did this whole podcast on prison consultants. We'll talk about prison in a second, but the... The rap on any expert is that, well, this is just a way for rich people to buy their way out of a prison sentence. And what they, people don't understand in this country is that a lot of these methods of advocacy were born and raised in the indigent, indigent defense community and the indigent defense system. So there is an imbalance because people can hire, you know, experts that may not always be available to legal aid type situations. But... For the most part, it's pretty evenly distributed, I'd like to think. Um, but anywho, so enough about me and my system. Let's go back to you. I think, um, you know, I talk a lot about the goals of punishment in, in this country, and I think uh, vengeance is just a big part of this because not only measured by the length of the sentences that we impose, but the, the kinds of sentences, what happens to a person when they go into an American prison system. And we're talking it's it's dangerous. There's a lack of adequate health care. Um, there's not good education. There's not good job training. Uh, it, it, there's just a big, big, big problem. A state more than federal. Federal's a little bit better, but it's still got a, a whole raft of its own issues. Um, I believe that if you're going to sentence someone, the idea of being incarcerated in and of itself is is punitive enough that you need to make sure that a person's going to come out better at least not worse, but hopefully better than when they went in, that that's a benefit to all of society. What is the, what's the philosophy of punishment there? Well, the philosophy, I think, is not that different. It's, it's uh, that we send people um, to prison to punish them, but also to rehabilitate them, um, 
and that they should get something out of prison besides three woeful meals a day and, and, and a, a prison cell. Um, <clears throat> and I think there is fairly substantial public support for rehabilitating most prisoners, uh, as is the case, I believe, in the US too, if you look at the public opinion literature. You, know, you tend not to see that stuff um, <clears throat> too clearly in the, the big stories that come out, but there is an abiding interest in, in, in the public in, on both sides of the pond uh, to have prisons that do something rather than just warehouse people. And the question becomes, well, what does that actually happen? And <clears throat> I'd like to think, and I think it is true to say that our prisons, the English prisons, are probably <clears throat> better places for a prisoner than the US. Um, but I, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's not necessarily a, a very convincing and compelling case to be made because we have um, very poor uh, educational programs, uh, psychiatric and psychological services, very poor ratios of psychologists to prisoners, this sort of stuff. Some of our prison estate uh, is pretty run down, um, pretty grim facilities. We don't have uh, overcrowding as a problem, um, but I, I generally think because the prison sentences are, are shorter here and there are fewer people going to prison, that we, that we do manage the prison estate or, and offer prisoners a bit more than maybe the case in the US. Um, <clears throat> but there's still an awful lot of work to do and there's an awful lot of people that come out of an English prison no better and possibly worse off. <clears throat> and a good example is the, we had a sentence <clears throat> introduced a few years back. Some uh, bright politicians said, we're gonna introduce an indeterminate sentence. So here's how it's gonna work. It's called an indeterminate sentence for public protection. And if you yeah, sentenced to this, you got this indeterminate sentence. When are you gonna get out? Well, you'll get out when you can convince the parole board that you've addressed your risk and reduced your risk to something manageable in the community. How do I do that? Well, you take you take these courses, and, you know, you, you're going to be drinking and you're going to be taking all these various courses to reduce your risk and blah, blah, blah. That's great. So when can I sign up for the courses? Well, we don't have any at the moment. <clears throat> so these IPP prisoners sat for years in some cases um, unable to get out because the prison service wouldn't give them the programs they had to take in order to get them out. Wow. So it's the kind of situation that Joseph Heller would have approved of. They're really caught in a catch-22 and that's caused a massive problem. And so now we're trying to get these IPP prisoners out. They were given a minimum term, but, but many of them were kept long beyond the minimum term because they couldn't prove they were safe to release because they hadn't taken the programs that weren't available. So we've got problems like that. That makes me think of we have civil commitment here, which is for sexually violent persons and it's indeterminate. It's a considered essentially a mental uh, issue and they'll be indefinitely detained until they're well, which could never be never. Um, but are, are these folks, is that, a, is there, are there certain categories or could it be anybody, someone with a drug, bad drug problem or just- they would, It would be somebody who represents a serious personal um, injury threat. It's been abolished. Okay. The sentence has been a bit been replaced, but there are still some people ser in prison serving the sentence. Okay. So it's been abolished prospectively. And so we talked already about, you know, that the sentences are, are generally much, much lower, but let's talk about the prevalence of the real high sentences because, you know, we have death penalty, which I think that would be a quick conversation for us. You don't have that. And then we have life without parole is very, very common. How does that compare? Well, it's a stark comparison. So we, we call the life without parole sentence here a whole life order. And <clears throat> this is when the defendant, so we had a case recently, may have hit the news there, police officer, serving police officer, used the cover of the pandemic to abduct a person, uh, um, a woman, <clears throat> 
by telling her he was arresting her for vi violating COVID restrictions and she was abducted and raped and murdered. Uh, <clears throat> cousins. So it's a single victim, but under hugely aggravating circumstances. So he received a whole life order. And that means he's <clears throat> the sentence will never expire. Uh, a murder carries a mandatory life sentence. So if, even if, uh, you know, for everyone convicted of murder, the sentence will never expire. But what happens is they are given a minimum term and they'll be released after the minimum term, which may be 15, 20, 30 years. But the whole life order is life without parole. And the only way that the whole life order or the life without parole a person will get out of prison is if you know he's close to dying and he makes a special <clears throat> application. So, <clears throat> but we don't have many of these individuals, thankfully. There are about 60 now. There are about 60, pe 60 people serving a whole life order. And I think there's about 60,000 uh, LWAP people in the US. Of course, the population is uh, what four times the size, but still it's a stark contrast, 60 to 60,000. Um, so we, we stayed away from life without parole. And one reason we've done that is because we were under the jurisdiction of the European Court and the European, European Court has said any life sentence must be potentially remediable. So uh, putting somebody in prison, life without parole, would be uh, an unlawful sentence in Europe, and we were under that jurisdiction. Um, <clears throat> so that, that's how we deal with the most serious cases. And most of the uh, LWAP cases here, whole life order cases here, are multiple murders. Wow. Cousins is not the, the police officer case I just mentioned. That is an exception as a single victim. Do you see that changing now that you're not under the EU's jurisdiction? Uh, we have seen a few more whole life orders recently. We, uh, we had one uh, the other day, uh, it's a revenge attack. Uh, a guy decided he'd burn up his neighbor's apartment and he practically burned the whole bloody building down and I think two people died. Um, so he got a whole life order. So we're seeing more of these, but I don't think uh, we're, you know, we're going to have a lot of them. The, the murder regime does it is actually quite good in the sense that it permits. So you could imagine a case where there are multiple victims, perhaps with other aggravating features, but the court can say, OK, we're not going to go the whole life order. We're going to impose the mandatory sentence, which we have to do. And the minimum term will be 40 years or 50 years, if you want. That may become a de facto life without parole sentence. <clears throat> But I think that there's sufficient headroom in the murder sentence regime uh, that we don't have to make the whole life order uh, very often. I like the idea of the sentences being remediable. Uh, remediate, did I say that right? But the idea that everyone's capable of redemption and changing their lives and worthy of a second look at some point, we don't get a lot of that here. Uh, okay, well, I think we're getting close to the end, but I am curious, juveniles try it as adults. Is that a thing? Uh, not hugely. Um, okay. you know, we, have a, we have a separate youth court, and we have a separate guideline for sentencing youth, and we also have a separate regime for young adults, 18 to 24-year-olds. Um, <clears throat> so if you were a juvenile or a young person convicted of a very serious crime like murder, you you wouldn't get an adult sentence. Okay. Um, all right. So before I ask you what I'd like to give you the last word, but before I do, because um, I'm I feel like I forgot something really important that you wanted to talk about. But I like to be hopeful in this sense that you know the purpose of this exercise is to shed some light on our own the our own system. What have you? What do you see in the United States system that you think we actually do well? Well, you know, the American sentencing and criminal justice system takes a bit of a beating around the world. Uh, but we need, we need to be nuanced here. Uh, you don't want to, you know, be too categorical. The guideline movement started in the U.S., and that has been hugely beneficial. Adversarial criminal justice, whether it's adversarial 
whether it's the adversarial trial or the adversarial sentencing hearing, I, I think is a very good thing. And, you know, we, we shouldn't be too, um, <clears throat> we shouldn't be hypercritical. You know, you take a case like Amanda Knox. Now, she was tried <clears throat> under the more liberal, more lenient um, <clears throat> European jurisdictions, Italy. Uh, and so what happened to Knox? Well, <laughs> convicted, acquitted, convicted, acquitted, finally acquitted. Um, and so for all the, you know, the slamming of the American criminal justice system, if you'd said to Knox or her lawyer, look, do you want to be tried in Perugia or Philadelphia? Uh, she'd have gone for Philly, Philly uh, I think, because I don't think Knox would ever have been convicted in an American court of law. I think the adversarial system uh, would have sussed out a weak prosecution case. So I, uh, I'm, but I, again, I warn your listeners, I am an adversarialist, and the, you know, people have different views. So I think the the adversarial model is superior to the inquisitorial one, and and from the perspective of the defendant, I think it's a great strength to say, yeah, Doug, you're my lawyer, you're out there. <clears throat> Uh, you know, arguing the case. Uh, so I think that's a strength. And, and I think the, the American guidelines, I'm not a huge fan of them, nor are you, nor are many Americans, and they haven't been adopted elsewhere. But it's hard to imagine any guideline in England or Wales or Tanzania or any other countries that have guidelines now without Minnesota, Pennsylvania, and so on, Oregon. So that's a huge contribution that goes back to Judge Frankel in 71. That's a huge contribution. So uh, we shouldn't lose sight of these benefits. Um, and that, that's what I would take away from, from U.S. criminal justice. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not a fan of the guidelines, but I had a, an in-depth conversation with a professor from a law school here. And the topic was, well, do we just scrap them entirely or do we fix them? And I was convinced that they were probably better off with them if they were fixed than without them. Well, I think yeah. so. And you just have to read, uh, uh, what is it, Justice Without, or Fairness Without Trial, Judge Frankel's book from 1971. It gives you a very clear insight uh, from a judge uh, about the state of play of American sentencing pre-guidelines. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> well, did I forget anything? Was this was a this was a pretty good talk? Thank you, thank you. I really appreciate it. And um, so, everybody, if you're looking for some interesting perspective on sentencing in the UK, go to sentencingacademy.org.uk. Professor Julian Roberts, I can't thank you enough for giving me an hour plus of your time. I hope that we talk again soon, and good luck with everything. I hope so. Thanks to you as well. That's it for today, but before we go, I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you. To you, the listener, for spending time with us today getting set for sentencing. Whether you're a lawyer, someone who could use the help, or maybe you're just a true crime buff who loves the inside scoop on how this whole thing works, I am so glad you're here, and I hope you keep listening. If you're interested in knowing more about what I do, mitigation videos, case consults, live teaching, on-demand educational content, books, articles, all of it, please visit www.dougpassonlaw.com. I'm Doug Passon. Until next time, hang in there. Wait a minute, that's a stupid way to sign off on a podcast about sentencing. Hang in there. What, what's the matter with you, man? I guess they call that gallows humor. Sorry. All right. Well, I will see you next time on Set for Sentencing. Bye-bye.